Good morning and welcome to this webcast version of Revision 2020. We will spend the day discussing how renewables can be used to realize a decarbonized, sustainable society. My name is Thomas Korbeyer. I'm the Executive Board Chairman of Renewable Energy Institute, and I would like to welcome you all to this event. We apologize to all the 950 people who had registered to attend a conference that we had to change the format to make it into a webcast. It would have been much more enjoyable to have all the people in a room together with the opportunities to discuss. But the most important thing for us was to spread the ideas of renewable energy as a solution to many global problems we did not want to contribute to spreading the virus. Therefore, we have improvised this solution with the webcast. We have still many speakers who have willingly traveled to Japan to contribute to this event. And first of all, I would like to uh, introduce the first speaker, uh, Francesco La Camera, who is the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, an intergovernmental organization set up a few years ago to support the global development of renewable energy as a solution to many of the pressing global problems. So, Francesco La Camera, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And happy to be, to be uh, also in this uh, unusual setting for, uh, for a conference. I think that uh, there is a kind of a parallel on what we are doing here today, the way we are delivering our presence in this, uh, in this conference. And see that this could be not imagined just a few years ago, where the information technologies doesn't provide us the chance to have directly access to your home and your computers. This possibly reflects also the history of renewable energy, where this septic has already considered renewables as a niche, something that may not become competitive ever. The fact is that today, thanks, for, thanks to the technologies, thanks to the efforts of companies around the world, renewables are emerge as the most competitive way to produce energy today. And uh, myself, as director of the International Renewable Energy Agency, I have the privilege to send to you the message of the immense potential of renewable energy. ARENA has a membership of 161 countries, and we have more than 20 countries in the accession phase. So we are not in the UN system, but in fact, we are covering with our action all the UN nations. Today, what I wish to discuss with you is how renewable, renewable can power a wealthy and a healthy decarbonized society giving a hint on the status of the global energy transformation and key action area focusing the teams of this conference, such as power sector transformation, offshore wind power and green hydrogen, as well as arena work projects. I will utilize some slides. I hope that this can clear to, to all of you. And as you can see, if we set our path to 2050, 
being in line with the maintaining the increase in the temperature below the 2 degrees and going to 1.5, renewable energy and electrification of the system can deliver the 75% of emission reduction that we need to stay in line with this goal. And if we add to this contribution the energy efficiency and other, we have the other 25% that uh, we need with this, uh, with this goal. The global energy transformation is absolutely underway. So one thing has to be clear in my message, the, the energy transformation is there and is absolutely unstoppable because the main driver of this transformation is the market. You can see from the slides how the capacity grow has been growing in the last years. And most important to be noted is that in the last seven, eight years, the installed capacity of renewables has been outpacing the installed capacity of uh, the traditional uh, plant. Now, one third of the installed capacity is coming from, from renewables. In the last year, more than one, 170 gigawatt of renewables energy has been installed worldwide. And we can see how the renewable generation is largely coming from hydropower. Wind and solar are gaining momentum as bioenergy, geothermals, and other sources, including green hydrogen. As I say, the main driver for this happening is the reducing cost of producing energy through renewables. We can see from the slides that put attention to the path of offshore wind, onshore wind, solar photovoltaic, and concentrating solar power as the decrease of the cost has been really dramatic in the last, in the last years. And trying to, be, uh, trying to be careful on one fact, that these are not estimates. These are simply facts. ARENA is monitoring 1717,000 projects around the world. So these are just numbers. There are not estimates. And uh, this project represents around 1,000 gigawatts of capacity in almost 150 50 countries. And uh, just reading newspaper, we see how this number is real. If you go to Portugal a few months ago, one of the last solar action, 1.7 cents for kilowatts. If we go to Saudi Arabia, 2.1, 2.3 cents for renewables. Emirates and Middle East, around 2 cents. If we go to Brazil, last auction, 2.1, 2.3 cents for kilowatts. If we go to Denmark, first hybrid action, wind and solar together. So the world is rattling, gain momentum in make the renewables the most competitive way to produce energy. And uh, what we estimate that before 2030, and possibly before the debt, in the next five, six years, will be more convenient to build a new renewable plant instead, instead to maintain in life an old conventional plant. And this is also important to say, and this means that if we go for plant, new plant that are not renewables, these are assets that will be strengthened by the market in the medium term. 
just look also to uh, a big countries, industrialized country, where we have the reducing of the cost of the storage. You know, one of the main problem that may arise when we talk about renewables is how difficult it is to put renewables into the grid. First, until 30, 35 share of renewables into the grid, this does not create a problem to the grid itself. So it could be not an alibi not to go for renewables. When we go for high share, we have to ensure that the flexibility of the system may achieve, may get more renewables into the grid. And it's not absolutely an impossible mission. If we consider that, uh, I will say that 50 years ago, we have been able to go to the moon. I think that 50 years later, we can manage having smart grid interconnection, artificial intelligence, they may provide all the instruments to have a more renewable into the system. And this is happening. Go Finland is going for 100% renewables. Portugal, Germany is already 50% more or less in the, in, the, in the grid. If we go to Uruguay, Costa Rica, we have example in, in all the world how it's possible to integrate renewables into the system, a goal for 100% renewables. We have had in the, our last assembly, last January, a session just dedicated on the experience on how it's possible to integrate renewable to the grid. We as ARENA, we have produced work to show that it's possible and this is feasible and this is economically convenient. One of the flexibility in some of this country has been ensured by large hydropower capacity. A hydropower may be a way to balance and make the system to be flexible. Storage, battery storage is also there. We have seen change in technologies and a rapid decrease on the cost. This is this example of Germany. 71% reduction over only just the last five years. So, and this is applying worldwide as the number say to, say to us. So another frontier that we will talk a little bit later is green hydrogen. And uh, when I talk hydrogen, I want to make clear from the beginning that we are talking about green hydrogen because today the largest part of hydrogen is produced by the uh, uh, fossil fuels, and this does impact any, in uh, all way mean in reducing the CO2 emission. So we want to have gain in this respect. We have to go for green green hydrogen. Naturally, there is a lot to be done, and the share of uh, renewable energy in total final energy consumption has to grow sixfold from now to 2050 to stay under this scenario that we have, uh, we have already described. And we have also need to increase our energy uh, efficiency. We have said that we have uh, existed in the last year on a slowing down of this improvement, we need to go back to 3, 3.2 improvement per year to stay in line with, uh, with, our, with our path. And here we can see in the slides how the, along the year, the growing uh, I have to say importance of the of the wind that we can say in the uh, blue light color is the wind that relate to onshore and offshore and we see how this will be growing as important around the year as solar and hydropower geothermal will maintain their 
their, 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 their relevance. We estimate the offshore wind power can and should increase almost tenfold by 2030 to nearly 40 folds by 2050. So it's a very dramatic increase that is possible, economically convenient, so that we can get around 1,000 gigawatt by 2050 coming from, from wind. And in this context, Japan is also doing, making significant progress with 2030 offshore wind installation targets of uh, 0 0.82 gigawatts. Technological development will be enabling raising this goal. You know that uh, also the oil and traditional oil and gas company can put experience in this field when we look, look about the deep uh, sea uh, platform. That, for example, we have in Norway, Equinor, traditional oil and gas company, working with Mazda for having offshore wind, one of the most large platform in the, in the world. Continuing cost decline will also bolster this development. And this means increasing economy of scale, most competitive supply chain. And we expect the levelized cost of energy of shore winds could drop to as little as three to seven US cents per, per, uh, per kilowatt. So we, we expect that a, a, a growing share of wind into the into the system. This could be very important in Japan that could lead on uh, offshore, offshore wind. Naturally, I'm always trying to repeat many times that uh, we have to understand that our energy system and the legal environment has been built looking at an environment where the fossil fuel were the predo predominant fuels in the energy mix. This reality is changing. And so we have to build an environment that will going to build the future. And sometimes it's difficult to build the future if you're still looking at, at, at it, having the eyes looking to the past. So it's very important we are going to build a new way to interact with the energy production and distribution. So we have a system where we uh, need interconnection for balancing the different way we feed the energy system. There is the transmission, the distribution, the information has to flow uh, among these different functions to optimize those processes. And we have to understand that the future will be, in the energy system, it will be more demon, demon drive. So the consumer will play the major role. The way we use energy is uh, different than in the past. It will become more different. The consumer will become also producer. So we have to take account of a larger share of uh, consumer becoming also producer. We have the way to have more uh, cars that will be fueled by renewable energy, the batteries. And this will become very important to stabilize the energy system. The more cars will be on the, on the street, the more we can balance the system. There will be the need for the smart meters, smart grids, etc. So it will be another way to look at the way the consumer are interacting with the energy in the energy system. And this has to be considered in, uh, carefully when we are looking to the, to the future. We see that uh, going 2050 means going to the on deep the electrification of the system. Electrification of the system should be 50% in 2050. And this has to be 
uh, as we say many times now, fueled by, by renewables. So we have to pass from the 20% today to the 50% in 2050 energy transformation uh, scenario. As you know, ARENA has uh, uh, regularly published in the occasion of the Berlin Transition Dialogue that take place first week of uh, April, last week of uh, March, uh, our roadmap to 2050. This year it will take the name of uh, Global Renewables Outlook, the energy transformation. And there we will try to demonstrate that it's still possible being in line with an increase of uh, temperature below 2 degrees uh, going for 1.5. And the report, we will also demonstrate that it's not just a commitment of a dream. It's real. What we will propose are real measures to get where we have to, to get for the decarbonization of our, of our society. We think that uh, hydrogen can play an important role I contribute significantly to the transition. And because it can play a double role, it can be an energy career and it can also play the role of storage. So it could be important together with the artificial intelligence, smart grids, to the storage to maintain the flexibility and adaptability of the, of the system. What we want to say very clearly that hydrogen, green hydrogen, in our point of view, is mainly to be dedicated to the heavy duty transport, to the long shipping, to the heavy industries. So when it will be difficult to go for the electrification of the system. Hydrogen could be an important player. And could be also an important player because through the metallization, it can contribute to be already blended and going to the existing pipe, gas pipelines. It can be used for, uh, <coughs> for the agriculture through ammonia. So there are many uses that can be attributed to the green hydrogen and uh, uh, making very, very convenient to go for, for, for it. Naturally, green hydrogen is still very expensive, especially the transport, but we estimate then uh, building on site green hydrogen to the sites of heavy industry plant could be already now or very shortly become very competitive. We are assisting that the pilots of green hydrogen are going from the kilowatts to the megawatts. We just learned two weeks ago that one of the most important group, industrial group Thyssen, in their iron, comp iron uh, plants are now starting to use green hydrogen to produce the energy necessary for the industrial, uh, industrial process. We see that unfortunately today, still the large production of hydrogen is due to the fossil fuel. This has to change in 2050, where the green hydrogen through electrolysis will become the most important way to produce hydrogen. And this will impact on the stability and flexibility of the system, but this will also impact on the decreasing of CO2 emission around the world. We estimate 
the hydrogen electrolyzer should increase from 0.5 gigawatts today to 1,700 gigawatt in 2050, ensuring the due uh, support contribution of green hydrogen to the energy transformation. Naturally, when we are talking about the transformation, we are also talking about money investment. Today, we invest early in renewable energy, 340 billion per year. We have to move from this to 750 billion per year. This means in the long term, going to the planet already investment. This is what is already planned of 95 trillions for energy plan to go for 110 trillion dollars, trillions dollar, US dollar. This means 18 US dollar to be redirect from the usual, the actual plan to renewables. It means the mainly subsidies on fossil fuel that have to be redirect and more 50 uh, trillions US dollar. But what is important to know, and this move to renewables and uh, this increased investment will produce benefits from the economical point of view with more than 2% of GDP in 2050 and more jobs. So first of all, going for renewables is good for the economy, is good for society because it produces a net increase of jobs. Naturally, and I want to say this emphatically, it will be also good for the environment and to solve the climate emergency that is on you, on us, in, uh, in, in this year. And this is a slide where we can say that it's convenient convenient to go for renewable just in, in financial terms, but if we go also in, take into account the reduced subsidies and the externalities, we can move one gain that could be from three to eight US dollar for every dollar spent on, uh, on renewables. And this naturally means investment in all around the, the world. And uh, East Asia and North America will require almost 50% of total energy investment in energy transformation. We know that uh, Africa, Southeast Asia will be the part of the world that will demand more energy in the next future. And this is important that the change will happen faster there. You know, multilateral financial institutions say no more coal plant. Investors say no more coal plant. Pension fund say no more coal plant. The Secretary General of the United Nations say no more coal plant. This is a clear message to the market. We're investing today in coal could producing strength asset in the very next future. Let me conclude by saying that I'm confident that achieving global energy transformation and largely avoiding irreversible climate impact is still possible. We have roadmap to get there, but it requires decisive and ambition action. All the world have to increase their efforts. And uh, this apply also for the international organization. And I will dedicate the last minutes to say what ARENA is trying to do, making private companies, innovation, government, investor, projects, having all part in this climate investment platform that we launched in the occasion of the Climate Summit last September. And that today is now on our website to make ready access to all the partners. We have already received interest by the multilateral financial institution, by bank, private investor companies. We have clustered our membership in 14 clusters. And we will come to have investment form from the last part of this year 
of the first part of the next year. We are supporting the reviewing of the NDCs for 110 countries together with the UNDP. We are, to this initiative, the Climate Investment Platform, we will provide an opportunity to match plans and projects with the financial resource needed. I encourage all concerned parties to join the platform and working with ARENA for the decarbonization of our society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco, for a comprehensive lecture with very much relevant information for this audience and for Japan. If you're sitting in front of your computer watching this and find it a little bit more boring than being in the room meeting the presenters, you should understand that even the presenters lack your presence. It is more difficult to speak to a camera than to speak to an audience. And when you've spoken, you don't even get the applause that you get from a real audience, from the camera. And if you make a joke, it won't even laugh at you. But uh, we hope that this will still provide all of you in the audience with the kind of relevant information that we hope will help speed up the development of renewables in Japan and in the rest of the world. We're now going on to the next session on revolutionizing or the revolution, the global renewable revolution, where we hope to be able to describe the uh, rapid development that is ongoing in the, uh, in the global energy system. But we will have a short five minute break before we do that, so you can uh, get a cup of tea or something for the next session in front of your computers. See you soon. So welcome back again. And now we are going to start a session on the renewable global revolution. And I will start by showing some slides or pictures of how the development is going. Francesco La Camera in his introduction described the dramatic reduction of costs for renewable electricity generation in the world. In this diagram you can see data from the American Lassard uh, reports how the price or cost of solar and wind has dropped and it's now also as La Camera said not only cheaper than electricity from new fossil fuel or nuclear projects but it's also outcompeting existing yeah. coal-fired power, uh, power stations and nuclear reactors okay. in the US as well as in yeah, Europe. I'm in my earphones. Yeah, I've put on my earphones. The non-fossil electricity generation as a result is seeing a dramatic overtake of or, or, or advantage of renewables. Renewables have grown dramatically in the last 20 years whilst nuclear is at about the same level as it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Wind power is the source of electricity that has grown the most in gigawatt. And the development in the first 10 years of this century was by far faster than anyone predicted in the 20th century. And the reason for that was that very few could dream of even in Europe or North America and probably not in Japan either, that China would go from having virtually no wind power at around 2005 to being number one in the world five years later. China's growth in wind power is really impressive. They built more than two wind power plants per hour, day and night, all around the year on average for the last 15 years. You can also see that the other large countries, the US and India are now on this list while the early movers like Denmark still have more wind power per inhabitant than many of those large countries, but they are so small they're not on this list of, of top countries anymore. Solar installations have grown dramatically in the last few years. It is now catching up on wind and soon, 
likely passing wind in installed capacity and a few years later possibly also in electricity generated. Uh, and here too the uh, growth in China is uh, a very important contributor to this development. It's also because the Chinese industry has taken a lead role in producing solar panels at low cost. On this slide you also see Japan being possibly number two in the world. The accuracy of this data is not so splendid that you can be absolutely sure, but Japan is definitely among the countries in the world with the highest installed capacity of, of solar electricity generators. If you want to make this even more enjoyable for, for Japan, you can look at it on a per capita basis, and then you see that per inhabitant, per capita, Japan is way ahead of China still because of China's larger population. And Japan is competing with Germany uh, among these countries that were on the top list on the previous slide. Now for some very recent data. This is a compilation that we have done at the Renewable Energy Institute based on statistics from the major economies in the world during 2019. And even though all data is not publicly available yet, we dare now say that what we saw in 2019 was the first year ever when electricity consumption globally did grow and at the same time renewable electricity production grew even more. And the result is that fossil fuel based electricity generation in the world decreased in absolute term, possibly for the first time ever when electricity consumption in total grew. If we look at individual countries, we see that the only country where of those major economies where uh, fossil fuel electricity generation seemed to have increased last year was China. India actually showed a decrease in fossil fuel based electricity generation and a, a significant increase in renewables, which was also the case in the EU and in the United States. Japan had a decrease in fossil fuel based electricity generation in the first 11 months, uh, an increase in nuclear and an increase in renewables. Another very recent illustration of how dramatic the change in the world's electricity generation is, is from Germany. During February this year, which was a relatively mild winter month where electricity generation was slightly lower than normally expected in the winter month of February, the windy conditions resulted in wind power contributing more electricity to the German electricity grid than fossil fuel and nuclear taken together. So wind alone was larger than all the non-renewable sources of electricity in Germany in the previous month. And again, what we are seeing is a revolutionary change where renewables are growing very quickly globally. And the result is that the share of global electricity generation from fossil fuels is decreasing. This curve looks very nice. You see a sharp decline in the share of fossil fueled electricity generation in recent years. But be aware, uh, this is an example of why you should not trust any energy statistics that you have not manipulated yourself because it appears to be a dramatic decrease because of the scale. If we show the same numbers on a 0 to 100 graph, you see that the decline is not so dramatic and it will need to accelerate if we are to meet the global climate targets that have been set by governments in Paris. So what we hope to achieve in this session is to show that we are on the right track. It's not going fast enough in the world. Not is it, nor is it going fast enough in Japan, but the industrial conditions to make possible a real revolutionary change of the electricity supply and total energy supply in the world is indeed possible. So with that introduction, I will now hand over the screen 
to Dolf Gielen, who is uh, also with the um, International Renewable Energy Agency, where he's heading the Technology Center in Bonn. And he will make a presentation to us via uh, a recorded webcast. So I hand over the screen to him. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great uh, pleasure to uh, address you today. I want to build on the speech uh, our Director General Francesco La Camera has just given, and I want to elaborate a bit more on some of the aspects we see in uh, global energy transition. Um, you just heard that uh, renewable power and electrification are the two core components of energy transition and in both fields we see rapid progress but we see also other emerging trends so there is now also increasing attention for emissions reduction in what is called hard to abate sectors such as energy intensive industries freight transportation aviation and shipping and I will address some of these issues and also we see that new solutions are emerging, notably hydrogen and hydrogen uh, fuels, so what are called e-fuels or power fuels, are gaining importance. And I would also like to elaborate a bit on that point. Before moving there, I want to give you some tentative numbers of what has happened in 2019. The, um, the, the, the statistics are not yet in, but uh, based on the, the preliminary data we have uh, collected so far, we see that it has been a good year for solar PV because the module shipments uh, increased uh, by 23%. It has also been a good year for wind, so the capacity additions uh, nearly uh, 60 gigawatts uh, last year. On the uh, electromobility, while there's a lot of activity in that area, the actual sales of electric vehicles last year only increased by 4%. So that's a bit of a mixed bag. But we see an uptick in some of the other areas, such as uh, the fuel cells and such as hydrogen uh, electrolyzers, which help with NQ's energy transition. Uh, in terms of uh, biofuels, so uh, if you take ethanol as, as the main fuel as an indicator, there has been a growth, but only uh, a small growth last year, and we need much faster growth in biofuels. So overall, a bit mixed, uh, mixed bag. We see renewable, renewables and uh, electrification as the three to core components of energy transition. So we need in total uh, a 70% emissions reduction from reference case, which includes uh, the policies currently uh, under discussion, such as the uh, nationally determined contributions. Uh, we need to, to, that yields roughly a stabilization of emissions at around 33 gigatons. We need to reduce that to less than 10 gigatons in 2050. So we need a 70% emissions reduction. And uh, we think that renewables and electrification of end use sectors, so buildings, industry, and transport, can contribute about 70% of that emissions reduction. We, <coughs> during the past year, we have received a lot of country questions how to get to zero emissions around 2050, 2060. So that is an emerging discussion. And uh, if, that, if that's the objective, then we need to look also at the hard to abate sectors in industry and in specific forms of uh, transportation. To uh, get from that uh, yellow line reference case to the green line, what we call the remap case. We need to accelerate renewables deployment sixfold. We need to accelerate the electrification of end use sectors fourfold. We need to accelerate the energy intensity improvements threefold. So while we're making progress, 
there is a significant effort needed to accelerate that progress. <clears throat> now moving to the case of uh, Japan, um, we see significant potential for uh, also renewable power deployment in Japan. We think that especially offshore wind can be important, so there's a clear global trend towards more offshore wind, which is driven by rapid cost reductions. Especially if you look uh, in this uh, graph on the right, you see that there are some very low cost projects coming on stream this year and in the coming year at around uh, 5 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, there is significant uh, potential for offshore wind also in Japanese waters. Uh, with bottom fixed, but of course an even larger potential with floating offshore wind, which is an emerging technology. We see now the first uh, projects uh, uh, coming on stream, which are in the order of, of uh, let's say, 50 or 100 uh, megawatts. And uh, that's uh, uh, worth, uh, worth also a close look in a Japanese context. And of course, there are already a number of demonstration projects in Japan. Uh, upscaling to bring the cost down will be key for rapid deployment of this technology. Second aspect is uh, solar PV, of course. There is already significant solar PV in Japan with nearly 8% uh, of generation, but we think much more is possible. Uh, we saw uh, end of last year ready auction results below 10 cents per kilowatt hour, also in Japan. Uh, average costs are still a little bit higher today, but we think that significant cost reduction potential remains for solar PV in Japan. We think that the cost can uh, more than half by 2030. And so the different lines show here the, the starting points of today's situation and the 2030 outlook for uh, G20 countries. And then in, in orange you see the the uh, situation for Japan. So one of these uh, the key cost factors for solar PV are the uh, investment costs. Uh, this graph shows our assessment of how the costs have developed from 2018 to 2019 in different countries. You see Japan is on the right in this graph, so there has been some cost reduction, but not very significant. So uh, more efforts uh, uh, are warranted there to get down more to these cost levels we also see in other countries. Now let me uh, move to the hard to abate uh, sectors. So uh, that includes uh, freight, transportation, aviation and shipping in transport. It includes the production of a number of energy intensive uh, commodities such as iron, steel, such as cement, and such as chemical or petrochemical. The total emissions are around three and a half gigatons from transport, but that's growing fast in these three sectors. And it's nearly 10 gigatons uh, in industry. And then at the bottom, you see also the gas system is mentioned, which is also an important emission source and also uh, one of these hard to abate sectors. So uh, overall, we're talking more than half of total global energy and process of CO2 emissions uh, uh, that, that uh, originate from these sources. The uh, issues uh, are, there are a number of issues uh, why it's difficult to, to reduce emissions in these sectors, but the narrative is somewhat changing, so we see uh, significant progress in electrification. We see also now significant progress in deployment of hydrogen in these sectors. Um, the uh, hydrogen is already an important commodity today. Um, in the remap scenario, we have a doubling of, of total hydrogen uh, production and consumption. And we have a marked shift in the uh, CO2 emissions of that hydrogen production. So today, around 1% of all hydrogen is produced from renewable electricity. We think that that share can grow to around 65% by 2050. 
with the remainder then being what is called blue hydrogen, so, so hydrogen from fossil fuels with CCS. So uh, through the cleaning of the hydrogen supply, uh, there is a great opportunity then also to use that, that clean hydrogen in a number of end use sectors such as uh, industry and such as transportation. So we see now many hydrogen projects, green hydrogen projects coming on stream. Uh, I want to, to dive deeper in one sector to show uh, what is currently being discussed and that is uh, the shipping sector. So there is a new uh, international uh, initiative for what is called getting to zero in the shipping sector. Uh, we are also a partner in that and in that context uh, a number of solutions for shipping are being discussed with uh, a view to deploy them in the coming years. Uh, there is for example ammonia considered as a, as a fuel for uh, ocean going vessels. So ammonia could be produced from green hydrogen but also uh, methanol either produced from green hydrogen or produced from biomass sources or also biomethane is being discussed amongst others. Of course we need to make sure that these fuels are indeed from uh, clean sources so for that we need a certification system. We also need not only the fuel supply we also need to make sure that uh, the uh, bunkering is assured and we also need to make sure that the ships are suited to use these uh, fuels. This is a very energy intensive sector. Between 25 and 40 percent of the total shipping costs are fuel cost. Uh, we think that by 2030 these clean fuels would cost roughly twice what bunkering fuels costs today. So we also need to find a way to uh, internalize these, uh, these air pollution costs and CO2 emission costs to uh, assure that, that these uh, solutions can be commercially deployed. Now finally I want to address uh, biofuels, which is also in our view a very important so part of the solution. We think that biofuel use needs to increase fivefold between now and 2050. If you look at the trend of investments in biofuel production, then that is, has been declining now for uh, the last uh, decade. We need to get back to that investment level of around 20, uh, 2006-2007 of more than 20 billion dollars per year to achieve that objective of fivefold increase and we will need both uh, what is called conventional biofuels but also especially advanced biofuels to grow faster. And we think that that can be a key part of the solution for, for example, aviation, but perhaps also in shipping, as I just uh, mentioned. Now, we have recently done a survey of uh, what are the barriers for deployment of, of biofuels. So we went to the major producers of these biofuels and we asked them, what do you see as, as main challenges? Uh, two key aspects emerged. One is the enabling frameworks, the other one is the economics. So in terms of enabling frameworks, the stability of regulation is a, is a key issue. Uh, in terms of economics, the uh, availability of, of, of uh, affordable and sustainable feedstock and also the, uh, the capex of the conversion processes were mentioned amongst others. So, uh, it's clear that, that these, these two components require further attention in the coming years to grow the deployment of advanced biofuels. So in conclusion, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed uh, picture. We see some rapid progress in some areas. In other areas, we need to push a little bit faster, a little bit further. That concludes my remarks. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to Dolf Gielen, who um, just now is in his bed. It's three o'clock in the morning in, in Europe where he is. And um, he is um, 
uh, he was great. Uh, he was kind enough to record this yesterday, and he will be with us uh, via webcam in the afternoon session when he has woken up in Europe. The next presenter is uh, from India, but also in Europe at the moment. But uh, unlike uh, Dolph, he is awake at three o'clock in the uh, early morning. Uh, Kartikeya Singh. Hopefully now the technology will work and he will be with us to introduce some uh, developments from India. Let's see if it works. There he is. Hello. The webcast is yours. Excellent. Well, um, I, first of all, I want you to apologize uh, that I am not there in person. Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? If you can hear us, Hello. you can just speak. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and throw up my presentation. Thank you. Um, and um, uh, I, I, you know, I apologize that I'm not there in person, but I am happy to participate. Uh, yes, it is three in the morning here. Uh, so this is a first uh, scenario for me to be able to participate in an international conference uh, this late at night. Uh, but uh, the India story is a very important one, and I wanted to make sure that uh, we were able to bring it uh, to the table uh, in this discussion that you all are having. Um, and hopefully there'll be a future opportunity to engage uh, in person. Um, I, I titled my presentation, uh, you know, India in the Eye of the Energy Transition Storm, because um, it does seem like um, India is very much in the thick uh, of an energy transition storm, um, dealing with uh, some remarkable uh, progress in uh, deployment of renewable energy in the country in the span of a very uh, few years, a um, few past years, uh, as well as dramatic reductions in the costs of generation of electricity from renewable sources. Um, at the same time, um, India, led by her states, are grappling um, uh, very much with this transition. Um, so let's start um, with, uh, you know, um, what is happening in terms of, I'm going to talk you through uh, the best way to, you know, it's hard to be a full-on India energy expert, and I tried to cover a lot in this conversation, perhaps something can be picked up. Um, in the Q&A or, or the discussion portion. But I decided to break my presentation down into what's happening in the power generation center scenario, um, key points in the transmission and distribution sector. Uh, I wanted to focus a little bit on India's states and talk about why they're so important uh, when it comes to understanding India's energy transition. And then finally look at some of the tipping points that are informing um, what's happening in the Indian energy market and where the Indian government is, central government is hoping to focus uh, for the next several years. Um, so if we start out looking at the generation mix, um, I think it's important to note, um, you know, coal uh, is still a serious um, part of India's electricity mix. Um, and um, gas, as much as I think there's a lot of discussion of, um, you know, a gas strategy for India, of um, foreign counterparts and, and partners wanting to help India transition to a gas-based economy. Um, there are approximately 25 uh, to 30 gigawatts of installed gas capacity, uh, but that their um, utilization factors are actually um, quite low. Um, the, the big story here in terms of comparison uh, of what's happening in the electricity sector in terms of the generation mix is um, really you have to look at kind of the year-on-year -year gigawatt increase. And if we compare um, the year-on-year year -on -year increase between coal-fired power um, and that of renewables, you can see that there's a pretty dramatic, and I'm pointing to the far right column here, um, there's a pretty serious difference between um, what's happening in terms of installed capacity coming online. Um, and this um, is reflected in kind of, um, let's dive, if we look closely at what's happened in the um, coal sector in particular, uh, just um, between the fiscal years 2019-2020 uh, uh, and 2018-2019, um, the difference um, of what the um, cumulative generation looks like, that you can see uh, that coal actually came out, uh, was decreased uh, quite dramatically uh, towards the tail end of 2019. Um, and for the first time uh, in, in the last uh, decade, uh, coal um, generate, uh, consumption also by the power sector declined. 
Um, so this is um, this is important to keep in mind. Um, you know, there was a, a surge in development of thermal power plants in India in the late 90s and through the 2000s. Uh, there was incredible expected demand. Um, uh, it was anticipated that the cost of renewables would continue to be quite high. Um, so, um, so there was a build out uh, of thermal power plants and that has, um, uh, many of those power plants are um, currently uh, operating at below um, capacity or, or I running idle or shut down, uh, not currently able to operate. Um, and so the government is having to grapple with these challenges uh, in the wake of tremendous uh, price drop in renewables. And you can see through this particular graph um, that um, new renewable energy capacity has overtaken uh, the installation uh, of thermal power capacity um, in the last three to four years. Um, and this is really broken down based on um, solar, wind, other renewable energy sources, large hydro and thermal. And the dark gray versus the more colorful bars is, uh, is what I'm comparing here. Um, if you look um, at how this scenario has played out for um, you know, planned and pipeline um, uh, as well as construction and operation of uh, coal power plants, um, you can see um, that the pipeline has continued to collapse of, of proposed projects in 2014. Um, also, the number of plants being constructed um, have, have gone down. Of course, some of those have moved into those that are operating. Um, so this is meant to sort of um, show you that um, you know, there has been a decrease uh, in, in the pipeline of coal planned for India for the time being. A couple of years ago, India's Central Electricity Authority announced that there would be no more new um, coal plants being um, brought online, aside from those that are currently under construction um, through 2027. Um, and the number of projects that have canceled have steadily increased. So the total cumulative uh, gigawatt capacity uh, that has been canceled is approximately 586 gigawatts worth. Looking at the transmission and distribution sector, and, and obviously I'm trying to cram this all into one slide just to give you a sense of, of major highlights, things that impacted on the transmission sector that were quite sort of uh, big that have come online in the last few years is that India finally unified its grid around 2016. And this was an important move because it allowed the flow of electrons across one unified market and allowed for better price dis uh, discoveries, the, the ability to sell power between the north and the south. Um, so all of a sudden, uh, the cost of power in southern India, which had typically been higher, uh, was able to be brought down uh, by having access to hydro resources from the north um, and renewable energy rich resources from the south, as well as the northwest, were able to cross uh, and be transmitted across um, one unified grid. Um, there's also been special focus um, and investments to um, green corridors to evacuate more renewable energy capacity that has been brought online. Um, and again, um, this has had a tremendous impact in um, decreasing the cost of electricity uh, across the board and especially allowing for uh, many utilities to benefit from lower cost renewables uh, depending on time of day. Um, in the distribution sector, and I think this is not really any secret, it's been well known that India's distribution sector um, has been at a, running at a loss um, pretty consistently uh, for a long time. Um, the, the last major bailout package or reform package, if you will, uh, that the central government um, enacted was in 2014-2015. It was called the UDEP program. Um, this was um, a, a, a mechanism to instill financial discipline in the utility sector. Um, and its aim was multifold. It was to really help reduce the technical and commercial losses of utilities to below 15%. Um, it was meant to um, increase, therefore, um, operational and billing efficiencies. It was meant to reduce the cost of power. Um, and um, the results have been um, not as good as I think the central government would have wanted. I think only about seven of India's um, 28 states have managed to bring down their technical and commercial losses to below 15 percent. Um, I think what made, um, and in many cases, the 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 gains that some states had made, additional states, uh, were eaten into by an equally important um, and, and quite laudable um, central government target of trying to finally um, bring 100% household electrification across India. 
Um, so for the first time um, since uh, you know India's independence, uh, the promise that successive central governments have had of, of trying to bring electricity connections to every household was met in 2019. Um, and what this essentially did was rapidly expand um, the, the service and operating areas of these data and utilities. Um, so to give you an example, you know, the northeastern state of Assam um, saw a jump uh, in consumers by 30% as a result of um, this uh, Power for All initiative. Um, and it created all kinds of other challenges um, for these utilities. In particular, I think it's it would be uh, remiss to not mention the lack of sufficient human resource capacities that some of these utilities faced immediately upon achieving that target. Um, so again, in the case of Assam, they had approximately, um, you know, the utility chairman had mentioned that they had 150 divisional officers responsible for 26,500 villages. Um, and of course, at the time, they were trying to increase the number of officers by another 3,000. Um, but as you can see, um, increasing the service area led to increases in technical and commercial losses and only fed further um, the problem of power theft, which continues to go on. Um, it further compounded issues of um, uh, varied tariffs being used for various kinds of uses, um, which is meant to be rationalized, so fewer slabs, um, making it easier to recuperate costs uh, investment costs that these utilities are making to expand their service area. Um, but without um, sufficient resources, the utilities um, have struggled to prioritize the investment in, in key infrastructure. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit of that when I talk about what's happening at the state level in India. Um, so let's talk about states. Um, most people think um, of India as this monolith. Um, you know, when we're talking about engaging India, and what's happening in India's power sector or maybe the health sector or a few other key sectors, um, that you're talking about something that's controlled by New Delhi. Um, now, what's really unique about India um, is, is the constitution is designed in a way um, that gives Indian states um, considerable authority over key um, issues or sectors, if you will, that impact people's daily lives. So um, there are uh, issues where the central government um, has authority, you know, defense, foreign relations. Um, and then there are areas um, where they share uh, responsibility. And um, when where they share responsibility, this is where the ability of Indian states uh, to have considerable authority becomes um, even more important. So the power sector is one of those um, uh, one of those issues or sectors, if you will. Um, so I'm going to give a, a plug for my former institutional home, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, um, which has a, a website dedicated to tracking weekly reforms coming out of India's states. Um, and they're reforms across you know, what matters to the business community, but um, I encourage you to, to, to sign up or to check out the website because on a weekly basis, a lot of the news that's coming out uh, from the power sector is, is power sector focused. So it's important to see which states are raising tariffs, um, which states are uh, providing more subsidies um, or reducing tariffs um, to get a sense of which Indian states are the most opportune to engage with in terms of partnership opportunities uh, when considering the sector, like the power sector. Um, and, and why do states matter? Um, well, again, um, if you, uh, you know, according to our analysis at CSIS and, and, and the key performance indicators that we are trying to showcase, um, you know, the central government has set this very um, ambitious um, uh, vision for India's renewable energy sector, you know, um, essentially going from 20 gigawatts of installed solar to 100 gigawatts by 2022 and additional 75 gigawatts of renewables um, added to that. So a total of 175 gigawatts. But while the central government can certainly set that vision, um, we need to really, you know, there's a lot of question about whether or not they're going to meet that target. Um, and I think instead of sort of um, guessing at that, we really need to um, look at how the states are in meeting that progress. So uh, when it comes to tracking these um, national level targets for renewables, one needs to look at what's happening at the state level. Um, I've also shared a little bit of a snapshot of um, what's happening uh, in terms of the stress thermal assets. Um, and you can sort of get a sense of which states are holding on to the greatest stressed um, thermal power assets. Um, and those that, you know, that's important to know because then those states are um, going to have to make some very important um, procurement decisions as far as where they are, or they are in the midst of doing it, uh, where um, cost of power has come down from renewables. 
um, and they are, um, you know, having to manage their generation portfolio um, uh, with increasing number of thermal assets um, going underutilized. Um, so, you know, states continue to be the laboratories grappling with this energy transition. Um, all of the states, um, if you go and speak to the power officials, will tell you that they want to be power surplus. There was a time in, in 2017 where I think I visited uh, over a period of one month, um, 15 odd states, all of them, most of them had claimed um, that they were power surplus. Um, and so, as you can see, there's been tremendous build out of, of power um, installed capacity um, and um, without ability to export to all the neighbors. Um, this has created um, a sort of a paradox of plenty. Um, but uh, if there's one thing that you should walk away from this presentation is that in order to really engage with India's power sector, you need to look at the states. So on a quarterly basis, India's central government um, holds a power minister's uh, and power secretary's conclave, and they put out these minutes uh, of the meetings. And I think the minutes are quite interesting. Um, they might seem dry to most people, but um, it's important to read into them to kind of get a sense of the overall trends um, and what kinds of issues are being raised by the Indian states that are that should be watched by investors, uh, by foreign uh, governments that wish to engage with India's power sector, or even um, research institutions that wish to, wish to study uh, what's happening in the power sector. So from the last quarter's power sector's, um, power minister's conclave, um, here are some of the key things that I had picked out that I thought were important to note. Um, so up until the end of last year, um, you know, the, the plan of the central government to have states uh, install millions of smart meters, had, it, was, it was clear that they had, it had not taken off. Um, you know, the targets were not being met. So the operation and billing efficiencies um, that would have accompanied the deployment of those smart meters just hadn't happened. Um, and as you can see, the, the technical and commercial losses uh, were on average around 21% after that major reform package. Um, that um, the other key thing that emerged through um, the conversations is that the dues owed um, to power generators from the utilities uh, continue to rise. They stand at about $8.4 billion. Um, and um, so, you know, at the same time, uh, the bill owed by state governments to their own utilities are also climbing at about $6.7 billion. So this is in the form of subsidy transfer um, to the utilities for providing um, electricity at below market rates. Um, this is a classic example of how the, the electricity pricing is quite politically um, uh, manipulatable in India, uh, but that state governments allocate subsidies um, to the utilities, understanding that they're providing um, electricity um, at sort of variable rates to different groups of people and, and feeding sort of the cross subsidy regime that exists that tax more um, to um, the private sector and, and commercial interests. Um, also, the renewable energy portfolio compliance, many states have struggled uh, to implement that, but at the same time, um, while that has been a struggle, uh, the central government has urged Indian states to go beyond their renewable energy purchase obligations, um, and some states are actually going to be able to do that because they are um, more renewable energy rich and don't have the thermal power assets um, on within their boundaries. Um, one issue that has been of, of serious concern to investors in India's power sector, particularly in the renewable energy sector, um, have been cases of certain governments wanting to renegotiate power purchase, long-term power purchase agreements that stand in place. Um, and this is something that they um, have the ability to do, and this is why Indian states are, are very important in, uh, uh, in, in the discussion and, and in sort of decision-making matters. Um, but, you know, having new um, price discoveries for renewable energy um, and with utilities uh, kind of being bled dry and in the red, um, wanting to renegotiate contracts um, has been of interest to some of these state governments to reduce their subsidy burden to, to want to have lower cost power. Um, however, it's, it complicates um, and, and affects India's um, business environment to, to sort of go back and, and negotiate some of these contracts or cancel them altogether, as was the case uh, by the election of a new government in the South Indian state of Andhra Pradesh, uh, an issue that is still being resolved. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to mention um, was critical tipping points in India's power sector. So this is some analysis from Ernst & Young that came out just this last January, um, trying to shed some light, trying to ready um, India's power sector managers uh, for the transition that they're likely to face. And essentially, I, mean, I know there's a lot happening 
um, on this graph, the, the key points that I want um, you to walk away with is there are a couple of tipping points that are important to keep in mind. Um, and the first one um, has pretty much already that has happened. Um, and that is essentially if you track the, the crossing of the teal blue line and the gray line um, around the number four, um, you can see that the variable cost of generation um, from uh, non-pithead coal power plant uh, is now more expensive uh, than the variable cost of generation um, from uh, variable renewable energy sources. Um, and that is tremendous. That is that is a pretty serious tipping point to have crossed. Um, the other tipping point that um, we may be in the midst of crossing um, is the one of the cost of generation. And this is the yellow line: uh, the cost of generation from solar PV plus energy storage systems. Um, so. Um, you know, there was a tender recently uh, announced by the Solar Energy Corporation of India uh, for solar plus wind um, coupled with energy storage, and that includes pump storage, uh, pumped hydro storage, as well as battery storage. Um, and the cost um, that was discovered through that reverse auction um, was competitive um, with uh, new coal power plants uh, that would be proposed in the country. Um, now, I don't know how many more of such auctions need to be um, carried out to, to firmly establish that tipping, that the third tipping point, which is energy storage uh, plus um, the cost of energy storage plus renewables uh, becomes more competitive with, with both pithead as well as non-pithead coal. Uh, we can firmly say, um, I don't think we can say that just yet, but I think we're kind of at the cusp of that tipping point being crossed. And um, then the final tipping point is the cost of generation um, from solar and renewables um, plus uh, as compared to um, existing thermal power. And the Ernst & Young analysis believes that this will happen somewhere between, um, uh, well, certainly happen um, somewhere between 2030 and 2040. And as you can see, um, they think that it might have the ability to completely displace generation from existing coal power plants. Um, and this is reflected in some of the conversations that you see happening um, you know, with, between stakeholders and power secretaries is this concern of technology lock-in. Um, you know, again, referring back to the slide of planned pipeline construction of thermal power plants and how we see those declining uh, and the number of projects being um, shelved. Um, and then finally, just wanted to show a slide about uh, looking at the levelized cost of electricity generation, comparing, um, you know, ground-mounted uh, utility-scale PV to, uh, you can see the coal prices below, and you can see that solar uh, PV ground mounted utility scale um, is less expensive uh, than coal um, and, and started to be so uh, in 2017 and will only continue to drop. Um, the last piece I will just try to run through because I'm conscious of time. I just wanted to uh, mention that in, in the budget that the Indian government announced in, in February for this coming year, um, they've allocated approximately $3 billion towards a solar pump project. And what this project is meant to do is to turn farmers um, into prosumers uh, of electricity, where they're given solar-powered agricultural irrigation pumps um, and incentivized to generate electricity, consume uh, that electricity, some of that electricity for their irrigation needs, but sell excess back. Um, to the grid. And this would probably also address uh, the issue of, of um, political manipulation of electricity prices for this large rural uh, voting bloc. Um, they're also hoping to roll out uh, hundreds of millions of smart prepaid meters across the country in the next three years, while they really wanting to step up the game on improving billing efficiency. Um, the next reform package for utilities uh, that will hopefully be announced soon will, um, will leverage this smart prepaid meter technology and also introduce the concept of distribution um, uh, licenses for uh, as a franchise model for people to basically take over a private operation uh, of district-based um, electricity distribution models uh, and allow for greater consumer choice in selecting the electricity providers. Um, also announced was that old thermal power plants that are not meeting um, you know, pollution with standards um, will be ordered to close down and the land will be repurposed. Um, the, the thing that probably will captivate, captivated a lot of people's imagination um, was that the prime minister last September uh, said that you know even the 175 gigawatt target had not yet been met and they're quite confident that it will be, that they're now aiming for 450 gigawatts of renewables by 2030. 
Um, and to do so, they're setting up a new renewable energy business promotion cell to help increase ease of doing business in this sector and reduce any sort of conflicts on land and contract disputes. There's another special tribunal being set up to resolve dis disputes between generators and distribution utilities. Um, now that the grid is reaches every household, virtually every household, the next focus of the utility sector is really to improve the reliability and the quality. And, and by that, I mean the frequency of the power distributed. Um, and on the thermal sector side, again, um, hoping to really address air pollution concerns by um, uh, installing a lot of these flue gas desulfurization technologies and, and making um, their power plants flex ready to help integrate more of the renewables that are being generated into the grid. Um, and, the, and the sort of throwaway piece that I'm ending with is that um, the electric mobility space is also key to watch in India. You know, billions are being invested in subsidies to really help boost electric two-wheelers, three-wheelers, and electric bus adoption across the country, addressing or providing a new business vertical for many of these utilities. Um, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions um, and continue this conversation with any of the participant members uh, virtually offline as well. Thank you, Katikeya, for that presentation on India, which I think clearly showed uh, one of the main focuses here that new renewable solar and wind is becoming cheaper than even operating existing coal-fired power stations. And we saw a decrease, as you illustrated and I uh, cited earlier as well, a decrease in the use of fossil fuel electricity generation in India last year. And what you showed about the future ambitions and plans and policies indicated that this development will go on in India. Here in Tokyo, I have uh, with me Thierry Leperc with uh, a long background in, in solar, in, in, in uh, large energy companies, and now with uh, a small uh, entrepreneurial startup on, on, on renewable electricity for fuels. And you were one of the early persons to describe the revolutionary potential in, in the renewable energy technology development. You, you, you said it and were cited, and I often refer to you in 2016 when you said that by 2025, renewable electricity will cost one cent per kilowatt hour. And as a result, the oil price will drop to $10 per barrel. Other higher oil price will just make oil outcompeted. Is that still uh, your projection, or have you modified it since then? I haven't modified it. OK. It's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And uh, if I was a bit immodest, I'd say uh, 14 years ago, I wrote an article in a French uh, uh, trade business, uh, business magazine. And I said, we should prepare for 2015, nine years after that. And, and then I wrote at that time, uh, solar is going to be cheaper than everything, every other energy sources by 2015. And this is when Solar Direct, the company I started, uh, was launched. Was it divination? No. It was just working with trends. And most importantly, making it happen. That's what entrepreneurs do. You know. Right. Uh, uh, some people can be analysts and prepare uh, 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 and see things in the future. Um, when you're an entrepreneur, you make things, things happen. So yes, we are about to see a shock, a market shock. But before that, I'd like to talk about another shock. That's a climate shock. Mm -hmm. We should have that fully in our mind. Climate is what all of this is about. A few weeks ago, the French president went to Chamonix. Chamonix is a very well-known uh, resort in, uh, in the French Alps. And it's just not a ski resort. It is also <coughs> a, a location where you have a myth, I'd say, in the French soul. And that myth has a name, it's uh, the Mer de Glace, the Sea of Ice. It is an, it was, <laughs> an immense sea of ice uh, next to Mont Blanc, the highest mountain in Europe. And, and it's gone, or quasi gone. Mm -hmm. The French president went there and, and they had to bring an extra ladder, not because he's not that tall, <laughs> uh, an extra ladder because the melt is so quick 
that changing the ladder every single year is not enough. You need to change it. This C of I's today is a trickle. It's gone. And just a couple of days after Macron was there, the temperature in, in, uh, in Chamonix was 15 degrees. That's 14 degrees higher than the normal. And we know what is going on. We know Australia. We know California. We know, we know Paris, 43 mm -hmm. degrees. I was there in July, 43 degrees in Paris. It's an absolute emergency, and we have the numbers. And the numbers are given to us by the, um, uh, by the United Nations. They're telling us something very, very simple. In order to meet Paris, the Paris Agreement, we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 7.6% annually from today. Not grow them, as we've grown them in the last couple of years, but reduce them by 7.6%. And if you think about what carbon emissions are about, um, they're basically uh, fossil fuel emissions. Mm -hmm. Today, carbon emissions are 36 billion tons of CO2, and emissions linked to fossil fuels are 36 billion tons. So the message from the United Nations is very simple. We have to reduce our fossil fuel consumption by 7.6% annually today, mm -hmm. which means, in other words, we need to get out of fossil fuels immediately, completely, mm -hmm. to go to 100% renewables, because obviously, if you're doing away with, um, uh, with uh, 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 fossil fuels, you need to replace them with something. So we need to go to 100% renewables immediately. But what you're saying is, we need to do it, and it's profitable. So what's the problem? It's happening. Because the climate shock is responding a market shock. I'll give you mm -hmm. a few examples. No. I'll go like the oil men do <laughs> from upstream, mm -hmm. midstream, downstream. Mm -hmm. Let's think about oil. Because oil is everything. Oil is this wonderful product. Mm -hmm. It's a great product. It does everything. It delivers energy supply for industry, mobility. It's done that for over 100 years, and it's, it's brought our civilization as we know it. Mm. The only thing is that we need to do away with it. It has to be finished. So, but it's not just a wishful thinking. Uh, let me get you through three market shocks which are shaping our world today. Mm. The first is an upstream market shock. I'll go take you to Spain. As we speak today, um, there's 101 gigawatts of solar projects that have permits and grid connection rights in Spain. So that's like the global installation last year. And this is in just, Spain just one alone. Country. No. For people to understand, right now, the total installed capacity in Spain is less than 7 gigawatts. Mm -hmm. And the number of projects which were there is less two years ago was 1 gigawatt. So how have we moved, how on earth have we moved from 1 gigawatt of solar mm -hmm. project in Spain to 100? Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, is two and a half times the total capacity of the Spanish grid. And the reason is, and was explained by uh, Francesco Le Camera earlier early, early today, uh, is that solar is not only cheap, <laughs> it is extremely cheap. 15, we're talking about $15 or close to $15 a megawatt hour, mm -hmm. which is one third of the wholesale price in Spain. So mm -hmm. everyone that has some land in Spain today mm -hmm. say, I'm going to go become rich. Mm -hmm. The shock we're talking about is the shock of people wanting to become rich quick. Mm -hmm. And that is the most powerful motivation on Earth before saving the planet. Making money quickly is what it is about. And the combination is even better. And that, that's what you said before. Getting rich quick and saving the world at the same time is quite that's enjoyable. That's a side effect. No, but it's Make enjoyable. It. <laughs> so what we're seeing today is a <laughs> mass of solar projects. And that's the case in Spain. That's the case in other countries today because of, of the market. Mm -hmm. The market today tells us or gives us, gives the possibility for these massive amounts of energy to come online and to displace fossil fuels very quickly. That's an upstream market shock. Uh, the second market shock is customers. A few 
<laughs> months ago, I was talking with the top executive of uh, a very big oil company. Hmm? And, and this lady, it's a lady, she was telling me, Thierry, we have a problem. I say, Gabriel, what is your problem? Our customers. So what's wrong with your customers? Hmm? I think, by the way, if a company starts having a problem with its customers, uh, it then something's happening. Mm -hmm. I say, they all want it. They all want what? They want entirely zero carbon supply of mm -hmm. power and gas. Mm -hmm. When do they want it? Now. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, they're not ready to pay an extra price for that. And they're saying, our salespeople are crazy. They're saying, how can we supply these things to our customers? Well, the first message is that customers go away. We don't, mm. don't have the product. So, mm. But when you have the largest pharmaceutical companies, because the, the, one of those customers is actually the largest, one of the largest European pharmaceutical companies, saying, I want the product now, Sanofi. And if you're Total, because mm. that's the name of the company, I say, mm. you know what? I'm sorry. Be ready for a very, very harsh awakening mm. that is going to happen very quickly. Third market shock, and it's happening right now. All these things I'm talking about are mm. not things in the future or wishful, etc. It's happening. And it's happening with the most powerful thing of all, it's finance. Mm. Do people, d d does our audience know that the index of oil exploration on Wall Street, the S&P, ENP, Exploration and Production of Oil Index, has gone down by 90% mm. in the last six years. 90%. Quasi-total oblivion. Mm. The stock price of major oil companies has gone down in the last six years by 40%, while the Standard & Poor's Index was going up by 60% of what we have today is a near oblivion, financial oblivion, of oil and gas, and that goes everything, everywhere. And you could use concrete examples like Equinor's decision not to continue drilling outside Australia last week, or, or uh, uh, tech resources in Canada dropping their tar sand projects because they don't, they can't finance it, they don't see the future market. The tap is closing. No. I was discussing another example. I was discussing with a senior executive of BlackRock. BlackRock, $7 trillion. Mm -hmm. They were saying the energy people don't know it, but within 36 months, no, nobody, and that includes BlackRock and the others, mm -hmm. will finance a fossil fuel project. Mm -hmm. The European Investment Bank has decided, announced that mm. it would no longer finance not only oil, coal projects, natural gas projects, over. So what we have today is finance moving away from traditional fuels. And does that sol solve the situation? No. Why? Because we have to get back to what a system, an energy system is about. Energy system is about, first thing that you want from an energy system is energy security, 24-7. Mm. The second thing that you want is it's that it's affordable and competitive. And the third thing, now obviously the most important thing, you want to have it decarbonized. And we will, we will come back to those things, I think, in the hydrogen session after lunch, <laughs> because that is where we will solve these challenges. But I would like to challenge you on another point, and that is that what you have described, and we heard from, uh, from the Indian report and from Francesco's introduction and, and, and Dolph, was that there were a lot of things that were going in the right direction. Uh, cost uh, relationships were such that renewables are, are now uh, superior to the fossil fuel alternatives. Customer wants it. You can't finance uh, the fossil fuel uh, fuels, but you can easily finance renewable energy project. And still, the development is slow in general very slow in some countries, and you were just describing where those areas where it was really fast. But the, the slowness, the reluctance to, to uh, adopt the modern technologies and a real open competitive market and realize this, for example, in Japan, is still 
making development rather slow. China just opened up for building new coal-fired power stations in many parts of the country. OK, whose fault is it? Exactly. Is it, and there is a tendency to say, oh, it's the fault of the governments. Mm -hmm. The government should do this, mm -hmm. should do that, should facilitate this, and why subsidizing, helping them. Uh, it's the fault of the, the bad oil and gas and utility companies mm -hmm. that are fighting rearguards. I'll tell you whose fault it is. There are people who are extremely guilty mm -hmm. about this situation. It's the renewable energy people themselves. Mm -hmm. They're lazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. They want support from the government. Right. And they're not s growing up enough to say, we stand for the system. And it's a cultural issue. Yep. I was in this very big solar event in, 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 in France, UPVSEC, a couple of months ago. And I was struck by the idea that you had on one side this confidence that solar is the cheapest form of energy and is, and is winning, obviously. Mm -hmm. At the same time, people feeling, I cannot be the system. Somebody else has to take care of the system. And what mm -hmm. we have today, I think it's a cultural thing. And those people who work in the energy, in a renewable energy world uh, uh, today, have to say, I'll yeah. use the Kennedy uh, metaphor. Mm -hmm. Don't think what exactly. this government can do for you or the, the country can do for you and what you can do for the country. And we need, as energy renew, renewable energy people, to say we are standing for the system. We're standing for energy security. We're standing for energy competitiveness. And we are ready to take over. Hmm. And that's a mindset, hmm. a mindset of trust, of confidence, confidence in yourself, confidence yeah. in the others. And not just waiting for other people to give you subsidies, objectives, regulation. I think the renewable energy people are at fault. Hmm. They need to grow up and seize the opportunity. Right. I wouldn't say everyone, but I, I recognize it from an energy commission in Sweden 25 years ago when we tried to establish what was really the cost of wind power. And it turned out that there was some good objective data from the energy agency at the time. But then uh, there were two categories who said that, no, no, wind power is much more expensive. And one was the nuclear industry who wanted to pretend that wind power was impossible. The other was the wind power people exactly. who wanted subsidies. Uh, and uh, so I do agree with this point that, that those who are accustomed to receiving subsidies and support are not willing to really fight in a competitive environment. They, they may slow down the development as well. Uh, Mr. Singh, the Indian debate and the renewable energy actors in India, how ready are they to, to, to really take on the responsibility to, to, to take over the electricity supply with responsibility and out-competing the fossil fuel industry without subsidies? Well, I think um, if you speak to many of the renewable energy providers, they believe that, um, you know, I've heard at least from key players that they don't need the subsidies anymore. If anything, um, the, the strong market signals given by the political establishment at the center, as well as the tremendous success that has ensued in uh, as you saw from my presentation, bringing down the levelized cost of electricity from renewables vis-a-vis -vis, uh, pit and non-pit head um, coal in India. Um, now it's really time to sort of winnow out. Um, uh, there will be probably some mergers, um, but really uh, bolster some of the companies to come together um, and really move forward on, on the task of, um, uh, that the central government has really outlined. So first meeting the 175 gigawatt target and then really uh, moving full throttle towards uh, the 450 gigawatt target. That's not to say that there aren't significant headwinds um, due to subsidies. A, a large number of players have come in that have really uh, tried to bring prices down even further, uh, but they're kind of questionable players. Uh, uh, you know, quality could be questioned in some cases. And so there have been um, stories of, of tenders or, or power purchase agreements um, where tenders were announced for power purchase agreements that didn't receive the kinds of bids the government was hoping for, um, or there were disputes that really resulted in not actually getting those project, projects launched. Uh, what is the, the attitude within the 
existing incumbent electric power companies in India, are they changing or are they continuing to pursue their coal-fired power station uh, strategies? That's a, that's a very good question and, and probably the best marker. As you saw from my presentation, the, the utilities are kind of the linchpin to understanding the energy transition in the India's sector and their financial health matters. So of course, the state-owned utilities are the ones um, that um, are uh, you know a little bit more uh, beholden to the politics of the country, but the private utilities um, are an important bellwether as well. So I think it was April last year that Tata Power and Tata, everybody knows, is an industry titan, announced that yeah. it is transitioning away uh, from thermal power uh, as part of its generation portfolio. Um, they're currently threatening uh, five Indian states um, that have not given them their dues uh, uh, for power produced by uh, a four gigawatt thermal power plant that Tata owns in Gujarat, uh, that they will just shut off the power um, because they're outstanding dues. Um, and uh, and it costs more to generate the power from that coal than it would for some of the renewable assets in their generation portfolio. Similarly, today, the Tamil Nadu state utility, this is a state-owned one, um, announced that they have a, uh, several uh, thermal power plants that are uh, you know under construction that they're not going to stop. But there's about seven gigawatts uh, in the pipeline that hasn't started construction. Um, and they are open now, uh, as of reports to today or yesterday, I guess, um, um, <laughs> to perhaps revisiting whether or not they should even install those uh, those power plants or bring that generation capacity online, start the construction, given the recent tender of solar and wind plus storage. Um, if those kinds of prices can continue to be discovered uh, in auctions that are run, then the case uh, for many of these uh, thermal power plants that are in the pipeline really uh, is up for, uh, is a question. Um, so these are the signals that are coming from both state-owned as well as private utilities right. in India. Thank you. And now uh, I showed in the beginning the data from last year indicating not concluded yet, but indicating that we actually had a decrease in fossil fueled electricity generation from 1918 to 1919. Do you think it will ever increase again? What we have today is a situation where uh, there's panic. Mm -hmm. Panic is growing yeah. in the boards of directors. I know something, but I was at the board of director, uh, I mean, uh, at the executive committee of a, a very large utility for, yep. for three years. And I, 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 um, I could say a lot of things about how the panicking mm -hmm. uh, situation uh, in, mm -hmm. in those companies, which are looking at their, it's very simple. They have assets. So it uh, will not increase again, or will it? You have to answer now because our time is out. It will collapse. It will collapse. <laughs> OK, thank you. With that optimistic idea of a collapsing fossil fuel electricity generation industry, we end this session, which is the last one before lunch. We will resume with another session on green hydrogen, using electricity from renewables to produce hydrogen to substitute fossil fuels in other sectors. That will start at 1 o'clock. Until then, enjoy your lunch.